John Ben Shepherd often said that every citizen must leave his community and state a better place than he found it. No one worked harder to uphold this idea than General Shepherd himself. John Ben Shepherd was born in 1915 to pioneer East Texas families. He grew up in Gladewater, where his leadership and integrity were evident even when he was a young boy. Oh, I think it, he was always destined to be into public service because he always was from the time he made speeches when he was seven years old that it was just something that was in him and he was so full of energy and he had so many ideas and wanted to carry them out which he did. This is his boyhood home. The house had a stone wall around it and when John Ben was little maybe six or seven years old he'd get up on that stone and wave his arms and make speeches to anyone that would stop and listen. His childhood friends recall that he organized the town's first Boy Scout troop and lived its ideals. John Ben Shepherd graduated from high school at Texas Military College in Terrell. At age 17, he organized Gladewater's Junior Chamber of Commerce chapter. This began his lifelong love of the JCs. He attended the University of Texas at Austin, where he earned both his BA and law degrees. After college, John Ben was elected president of the Texas JCs. His legal and JCs career was interrupted by three years of service in the Army. He came back with renewed vigor, and in 1948, he was elected president of the United States JCs. His contacts and travels as national president set the tone of his later political career. It's hard to get across just what a good speaker he was. You, know, you hear the term, he was a, an old-time orator, and he really was that. And I don't hear that much today, but he was a very powerful uh, speaker and people, his audiences, really got a lot out of what he had to say and how he said it. And there were tears in my eyes at nearly every speech. In 1949, he was named one of the 10 outstanding young men of America in a group that included future president Gerald Ford. In 1950, he emerged as a public political power in Texas at age 34. When Governor Alan Shivers appointed him Secretary of State, John Ben easily won his first statewide race in 1952 as Texas Attorney General and was re-elected in 1954 by the largest majority of any office holder. During his term, Shepard moved aggressively to clean up corruption in Duval County, which had reached its peak of notoriety in 1949. In Duval County, it really started when he was Secretary of State and he refused to certify the vote from Duval County because even the, the jokes were that the cousins and uncles had come back and voted and they had been dead for years. I think the story everyone always likes me to tell about John Ben has to do with the Tidelands Act. When Sam Houston defeated Santa Ana at, at San Jacinto, on the battlefield that day, he negotiated that Texas would receive the water rights in the Gulf of Mexico. Roughly three miles out today is state waters, 10 miles out is, inter is national waters, federal waters, beyond that's international waters. We got the whole 10 miles for Texas. When we became part of the United States in 1845, we retained that right. So other states had three miles, we had 10. Fast forward, people are trying to take those water rights away. Uh, the Supreme Court, Texas loses the Supreme Court a couple of times, and, and we, we lose those water rights. And Congress at that time had Lyndon Johnson, who was a very good friend of John Ben's, and Sam Rayburn in the House. So the Congress could pass anything Texas wanted, but President Truman vetoed it several times, the law that would have restored Texas water rights. Then comes the 1952 election, and it's Dwight Eisenhower, who was a native Texan, versus uh, Adlai Stevenson. Obviously, the Texas Democratic Party ruled Texas at the time. John Ben negotiated, in essence, that situation very quietly. You don't find much about it in the history books. It was done very quietly. And at the end of the day, Eisenhower wins the election, becomes president. The Tidelands Act is passed again by Johnson and Rayburn. Eisenhower signs it. We get back the water rights. And we've had them ever since. Now, why that matters so much is because the permanent school fund that, that for, for construction at all the public schools in the state of Texas is funded by the oil rights in the Gulf of Mexico. Most of those oil rights take place between three miles and 10 miles. So literally, every kid that's walked in a new building <laughs> in, in a public school in Texas in the last 60 years 
benefits from this. Well, John, being understood that uh, in leadership, uh, in policy matters, that there had to be a consensus among the parties that we're talking about. And he was good at getting people together, forming the consensus. Then he was excellent in developing a plan to carry that out. And then he was consummate in follow through, making sure that the plan was carried out and the matter got across the goal line at the end. He was the kind of fellow that you could not say no to. In January of 1957, John Ben Shepherd left public office and moved his family to Odessa, where he entered private practice and corporate law. Despite a busy professional life, he chaired numerous volunteer committees. As chairman of the Texas Historical Commission in 1963, he organized the official State Highway Historical Marking Program and wrote legislation creating Texas's 254 county historical commissions. This marker program on the highways around this state, I can, whenever I pull up the one, I can tell if he wrote it. Just by the language on that, those few words on a marker, I can tell if he wrote it because he had a distinctive style. John Ben Shepherd served as the first chairman of the Texas Arts Commission and was instrumental in founding the grassroots lobby group, the Texas Arts Alliance. Shepard was appointed to the Texas State Archives and Library Commission by both Governors Clements and White and served 11 years. John Ben Shepard was my father and growing up with him was a living history lesson. We grew up in East Texas in Gladewater and then moved to Austin for many years and then um, ended up our, our time in Odessa. So we were true Texans through and through, and Dad made sure that we explored every inch of it. We never knew where we were going. We were probably going to tramp through some graveyard, looking for some headstones. We were going to some national archives. We would be going over a mountain to look for a trail that we knew was there but weren't quite sure where it was. And that, that interest, that excitement, that recognition of what our world is, was just a daily lesson. My best description of him would be a one-man chamber of commerce. He just had, energy is a word that keeps coming up, but he had a great gusto about him that generated excitement around him. And he was busy writing columns for the newspaper and planning celebration events and reenactments, if you can imagine, on the Great Plains of West Texas, we were reenacting the Battle of Lexington and Concord on the 200th anniversary of its event. Shepard was a strong advocate of education. Long before it became a reality, John Ben was seeking legislation to create a university in West Texas. One of the things I would like people to remember about John Ben was that he was intensely interested in the university. Midland, Odessa were the only major metropolitan areas almost in the, in the state of Texas that didn't have a public university. And there was great interest in doing that. And he knew whom to call, whom to flatter, and he did it very successfully. In 1973, the University of Texas of the Permian Basin opened with Shepard as one of its most ardent supporters. Living in the Permian Basin, People understand who John Ben Shepherd is and what his legacy is. And that's the important thing because he was a perfect example of leadership through service. And, and it's altogether appropriate that there's an institute in his name to talk about leadership because he's one of those people who in every endeavor left it better than he found it. The John Ben Shepherd Institute was created in 1995 by the 74th Texas Legislature and located at the University of Texas of the Permian Basin in memory of John Ben Shepherd and his legacy as a Texas leader. General Shepherd worked with us through the early years. He wanted to help young people have an opportunity for leadership, to learn about government and the issues facing the state of Texas because he absolutely believed that young people could change the world. One of John Ben's rare and unique talents was his ability to see the best in people and how to teach them to bring out the best in themselves. Because we were an independent nation joining the United States, we've got a different culture. He very much focused on that 
and wanted young people to have an appreciation of what that independence and value meant. I don't know of anybody that I've known in Texas that gave any more generously and any more tirelessly of their counsel and advice and their energy and talents than John Bend. Make certain that his spirit of the free enterprise system, his spirit of responsibility to our state and our federal government, John Ben Shepherd was the voice of Texas and the voice of reason, but the voice of patriotism. John Ben cherished his wife of 51 years, Mamie Streber, whose partnership sustained him through law school, political life, and a successful professional career. I fell in love with him when I was 17, and it lasted a lifetime. I found my marriage wonderful. It's been an absolutely wonderful ride, bumps and all, but it, it, it has been a great time for all of us. He's proud of all of his children and grandchildren and nourished their friendship. John Ben Shepherd lived a positive, exciting life because that's the way he approached every day. He was a modest man who stated often that he was friend and family made. One thing that Dad said that he wanted to be remembered as someone who stirred him up, and he did stir us up, and, and in a good way. John Ben Shepherd has had a profound effect on the lives of all Texans. Few have given so much, so freely, to build a better Texas. Show me a man with no identifiable stand on a clear-cut issue. And I'll show you a man with no identifiable character or value to his community. You can try so hard to stay away from the pro and the con that you become blind to the right and the wrong. We need men who won't get to the top through pull and then stop pulling. Who won't let the American way of life die of cold feet because they were afraid to get into hot water. We don't need leaders who will sit on a podium or stand on a platform. We need men and women who will stand on their own two feet and kneel on their own two knees. We must always remember that the good things of life are not bought with money. Nobody can open a safe deposit box and file away a title to an American sunset. No one can lay gold on the counter and buy the look of trust and innocence in a child's eye. No man can trade hard cash for the companionship of a true friend or purchase at any price the love and devotion of a faithful wife. And all of the money and all of the treasures of the world is not worth the sound of a mother's lullaby or the laughter of a strong free man. Because freedom is old, not young, yet it is born anew in the first cry of a free man's son. It is not a living thing, yet it dies if we do not love it. It is not weak, yet it must be defended. It is light, yet it weighs heavy on him who is without it. It is without price, yet it dearly costs the one who loses it. It is not small, but great, yet once lost, it is never, never found again. Yes, to be born free is an accident. To live free is a responsibility, but to die free is an obligation.